I'm Joanna Macris at Investor Place. Joining me today is Neha Palmer, CEO of Terawatt Infrastructure. Terawatt is really changing the way we think about commercial electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So Neha, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's dive in. Um, you sent, spent a lot of time previously at Pacific Gas and Electric for a number of years, and more recently on renewable energy at Google. So talk to us a little bit about how your work at Terawatt builds on and continues that work. Yeah, you know, for the last decade when I was at Google, we kind of had two main goals. Um, as a large electricity user, we really wanted the grid to be cleaner. So we wanted more green power on the grid. And we were doing that by directing our own energy procurement by buying as much green energy as possible. So we were the first company to hit 100% renewable, but what was really heartening was all of the other companies that eventually joined us. Um, it's pretty much a par for the course that a company has a corporate commitment to buy clean energy, but all the other stakeholders, utilities, regulators all moved along. And what you see now is that the grid is on its way, it certainly has a way to go to being 100% decarbonized and clean. And so I see the next wave of opportunity with transportation. And so at Terawatt, we are riding that second wave of decarbonization. Right now in the US, um, emissions from transportation are the largest sector of emissions. So if we wanna attack the problem of decarbonization, this is really a great place to go. Um, so Terawatt was purpose-built to focus on fleets where we see a huge opportunity um, as that adoption of electric vehicles in that um, cohort is happening really fast. So the S curve for electrification for commercial fleets is expected to be much faster than that for passenger electric vehicles, as you know, and companies like Amazon, UPS and others have all made major announcements to clean up their supply chain. So talk to us about um, some of the reasons for that difference in that S curve and how your company is really well positioned to benefit there. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, as you noted, there's a lot of commitments um, alongside the energy commitments. There have been commitments on supply chain. And so you see uh, complete across company decarbonization goals, which include transportation for transportation heavy industries. Um, but what I think made the big difference in energy and I think is making the big difference here is that it's financially viable and more viable to have electric vehicles. Um, the total cost of operation, which is the metric that companies use to assess whether they're gonna go with one vehicle or another is already positive for electric vehicles in the medium and heavy duty class. So for companies thinking about the bottom line, it's actually a great way for them to start to drive down costs. And sometimes if it's a key portion of their business, a significant component of their costs. So they're looking at it from a sustainability perspective, but also as a competitive and cost advantage perspective. So that adoption will happen really fast. Um, I think the other thing is when you have fleet configurations, some of the anxiety around charging that you might see um, with you know, passenger vehicles hopefully will be alleviated. And again, that's part of why we were created to help that transition and ease the transition for fleets. But certainly we see that there is a focus on doing this in chunks, right? You have one vehicle, one decision maker in a person, personal passenger vehicle, but you have one decision maker making the decision for 400 vehicles at a time. So that S curve uh, really driven by the sustainability goals and the cost um, and the ability to impact large volumes of vehicles at one time uh, will really, I think, accelerate here. Yeah, and it takes an enormous amount of power and energy to charge multiple electric vehicles in the same place at the same time. You know, talk to us about how Terawatt's technology balances those massive power needs with efficiency. Yeah, certainly. Um, just a statistic to throw out there, uh, I saw an estimate, um, a study that said that the electric generation in the U.S. will have to double if we had a fully electrified trans transportation system here in the U.S. Um, that's astounding because it's already big, uh, but obviously needs to grow alongside um, electrification. So, you know, at Terawatt, we're looking at a couple of things. We know that there's huge amounts of electricity required that requires the generation, but also the grid capacity to get access to that electricity. And we think that that's gonna be a challenge. Um, the number of fleets and where they're located, which is pretty much everywhere, is just astounding. And so if you think of a lot of large point loads on the grid, that will certainly stress the grid. So we realize that there will be other tools that'll be required to make this transition. Things like on-site electric storage, um, on-site electric generation, maybe in the form of solar, to keep it on the clean side uh, are all tools that will be required for two reasons. The first is to control energy costs. Um, again, 
a lot of the driver here is sustainability, but also cost. And so to make sure that that cost of electricity is as low as possible, having some of those tools will be required. The second is to be able to actually interconnect into the grid. Um, you know, the number of requests that utilities are going to receive is just going to skyrocket in terms of the request for power for electrified transport. So by having some of those tools, storage, electric generation on site, um, that will hopefully make that process easier and quicker and also less costly in terms of getting that connectivity to the grid. Mm -hmm. Terawatt is really uh, thinking about it from that perspective. And so, you know, we again have been purpose built thinking about the real estate needs for that type of an installation, where those should be located. And so we have property in 18 states where we've located near first movers of electric fleet charging um, in hopes of helping them uh, make that transition uh, smoother and easier. Yeah. The company's also providing fleet operators with financing and also additional charging at their own sites. Tell us more about that work. Yeah, so you know, when a fleet owner is deciding whether or not to electrify, they're often very focused on the vehicles. Um, you know, the medium duty class is now coming. We see vehicles arriving off lines. Um, heavy duty is certainly in development and you know, there is a line of sight to those heavy duty vehicles coming as well, but they're mostly focused on the vehicles. What's the cost? How are they going to fit into their operations? What they don't always focus on um, is the charging aspect of this and just the difficulty that they might have in having a new large electric load emerge on their site. Um, so we are helping them think through the CapEx required for that and oftentimes they haven't planned that in their budget. So we are able to develop, but also own and finance large scale electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So taking that from an additional capital cost that they have to expend to electrify to making it more of an operational expense. Um, we are excited to own assets like that. Uh, we are pairing infrastructure like capital to own assets like that. And that will really be a benefit to businesses as they think about the cost to make this transition. Mm -hmm. Um, some critics say that the battery technology itself is a limiting factor in the pace of adoption of commercial electric vehicles. Now, I think Tesla has said something like that the semi would require five times the number of battery cells as a passenger EV, but it certainly can't cost five times the price. You know, what are your views on the pace of battery technology and its influence and impact on, on you know, getting that commercial space going? Yeah, I'll go back to maybe my core, my core uh, experience before I got to Terawatt, which is the solar industry. You know, we've seen the cost for solar technology decrease by over 80% over the last decade. Um, it's pretty astounding. If you would have told me the prices of solar 10 years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, we see similar trajectories for uh, batteries as well. Um, the amount of R&D effort going into it is certainly intense. Um, and current technology is just decreasing in price as you get more manufacturing capability online. So certainly that'll be a key factor in adoption. But as I said, you know, the real factor here is the cost and that already is TCO positive for that medium heavy duty vehicle fleet driven by the lower cost of maintenance. So it'll be a factor, but uh, certainly, um, you know, we see that becoming an easier part of this um, as, as time moves on. What are your thoughts on the Biden administration's early efforts in terms of electrification? And do any of those have a benefit for Terawatt? Yeah, it's incredibly exciting to see all the detail and effort being put into electrification in terms of the infrastructure bill and other efforts that are going on. Um, what I'm actually really excited about is this uh, potential for a joint office of the DOE and DOT. Um, sitting here at Terawatt, what I see is that this is the perfect marriage of energy and transport. And those two have to really be coordinated to make sure this transition happens as smoothly and as fast as possible. So seeing policy develop jointly is really exciting. You know, for Terawatt and many others in the industry, things like tax credits for electric vehicle charging stations, um, renewable energy, all of those will be really beneficial. Um, but what we see, I think that's really exciting is this focus on mirroring those two um, different industries from the past, but really seeing that they have to be jointly um, plan and, and policy uh, plan around that. What are uh, the most important priorities for you and the business over the next 12 months? Yeah, you know, it really is making sure that we are developing products and delivering what customers, customers want. So understanding what they need as they start to electrify their fleets. Um, the second you know, piece of that is also teaching customers. Um, many customers have never thought about the scale of 
electric vehicles or the scale of the charging infrastructure required. They might be piloting one or two vehicles in a yard, but they haven't thought about what's the impact of having 50% of their fleet electrified. So it's kind of a journey um, in terms of working with customers to understand their needs, but showing them what the potential possibilities are um, with the technology uh, for charging and, and other things as they scale. So that's definitely a priority for us. Um, we're gonna continue to build out our suite of properties. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're in 18 states and we certainly see the need to expand. Again, charging it happens everywhere. There are fleets everywhere. Um, cities have bus fleets. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, um, you know, the last mile delivery fleets are everywhere because that is now a very important part of American life and having items delivered to your home. So um, certainly expanding our portfolio and then, you know, continuing to help the industry move forward. Um, there's lots of stakeholders here that I mentioned, you know, transportation marrying with energy, um, really hoping that, you know, stakeholders like utilities come along and make things like the process to connect to the grid faster and easier and more flexible to anticipate things like large loads that might all happen at night or, um, you know, flexible resources that might be on site that could put power back to the grid. Um, all of these are really important priorities for Terawatt right now. Excellent. Um, beyond electric vehicles and renewable energy, what are some ways that we can make our lives greener? Well, I am a city dweller, and this maybe is stealing from, again, my past life, but we used to talk about the megawatt, the negative megawatt. So the, the unit of energy you don't use is the cheapest and cleanest. And so, uh, you know, taking public transport, um, you know, all of these things are going to be really important as we think about uh, ways to make our lives cleaner and greener. Um, but, uh, you know, thinking about ways to not do something or not extend that uh, energy or electricity um, is really, I think, a great way to think about it and oftentimes saves money and can actually be a good exercise in some, in some senses for transportation. Absolutely. Neha, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much.